Dreadlands entered Early Access last month, and the game is positioned to do something very differently in terms of tactical strategy gameplay, kind of marrying it with MMO-style progression and design, as well as some of its own unique takes on the genre. And while I don't think the game has hit it all perfectly just yet, there's definitely something interesting to keep an eye out on for fans of XCOM likes and so on. Our concept is that we are in the Dreadlands, another post-apocalyptic world where only the strong survive. After choosing our starting faction, beginning with two available now, one later on, it's up to us to explore, gain power, and become the best dang faction or clan in the land. Now, the game is essentially split between two distinct systems. You have the kind of persistent layer, the MMO style uh, growth, and then you have the tactical layer. For the MMO side, how it works is that you'll build your faction out of various units. The units themselves belong to specific classes that are kind of denoted by their rank. So there's elites, scouts, champions, so on. This determines which units you can field in combat. You choose a formation, and the formations will come with various bonuses or designed to allow you to have more or less units on the field. Every character can be equipped with weapons, armor, items, ammo, all that good stuff that you'll have to make sure to repair or refit before each new combat or each new uh, tattoo layer. Now you can also get a number of tactical cards as you saw on screen right there and you'll have to be able to make use of them during combat and they'll do things such as revive units who are down, do free damage to an enemy, raise defense, lower stats, and you'll unlock more as you level up. The fame level that you see in the upper left right now, that's kind of your clan's level. As it goes up, you unlock additional features, new things you can do back at your home base, new characters can join you, and again, it's your MMO-style leveling curve. Now, from what I play during our run on stream, you'll find weapons, and you can get access to rarer versions of them that will have unique modifiers or randomized modifiers on them, while the basics just are the same thing, so the basic shotgun a is the same as a basic shotgun B. And obviously as you'll play you'll accumulate more resources that can be used to buy or craft and unlock new tactics and skills. And said skills are going to be used in the tactical layer. And the tactical combat, like we said, definitely takes cues from the cover focus strategy that we see in XCOM, uh, Mutant Year Zero, and again, a lot of XCOM likes that have been released in the past few years. So as you can see right here, I'm building up a formation of my characters, and the formation again dictates what units you can field, but you can put a lesser class unit in a higher class slot, but not vice versa. Kind of a way of allowing you to fill out your roles if you don't have these specific characters. Now. When it comes to the combat itself, like I said, this is the standard kind of cover base focus that we see from XCOM and similar games. We have an I go, you go system where your team goes first, then the enemy moves, and then we repeat again and again. Now, the main aspect of Dreadlands and what kind of separates it from other games of its type has to do with the emphasis on melee. Melee in tactical strategy games have always been a very risky prospect. If you can kill the enemy on that single hit, then yay, you're good. If you don't, or there's enemies nearby, then they basically get cover-free uh, base killing on that character on their turn. And this can always be that very risky prospect to it. But what Dreadlands does, and I think it's very ingenious, is that melee essentially locks the two characters together. What that means is that the attacker and defender cannot be targeted 
by their respective enemies with guns once they are engaged in melee. The lore is that they don't want to accidentally hit their friend. From a tactical standpoint, this really opens up the game in terms of providing unique strategies for melee or range oriented teams. If the enemy has a really powerful range unit, you can send a weaker or smaller melee character to engage with them and essentially take them out of combat until they've dealt with your unit. Now, units can disengage from melee, but when they do, the opposing enemy gets a free hit on them. And this, I think, is a really smart idea that helps differentiate Dreadlands from other tactical strategy games. Besides that, every unit has special abilities, we have the standards such as taking cover, hunkering down, everybody's favorite term, Overwatch, and so on and so forth. And as you play through the game, you'll, your characters will be able to level up, and you'll be able to choose unique passives or abilities that can help to differentiate themselves from similar units of the same class. Now, while all this does sound great so far, the game, I feel, doesn't seem to be, I think, firing on all cylinders just yet, or at least at the time when we play this on Early Access. And we're going to talk about that next, but first, a quick shout out to our current Game Wisdom supporters and sponsors. And now for a quick shout out to our current Game Wisdom supporters and sponsors. Going forward, all Patreon supporters will get early access to our videos. And if you'd like to continue this discussion on game design, be sure to check out our Discord channel, link down below. If you're looking for more wisdom about game design, be sure to check out my latest offering of books, 20 Essential Games to Study, aimed for first-time developers and students looking for some inspiration for their upcoming games, and Game Design Deep Dive Platformers if you're interested in anything regarding 2D and 3D platforming design. They're both available in print, digital, and wherever books are being sold. Dreadlands at the moment, or when we play this on Early Access, has the basics down, but it doesn't feel like the MMO style progression and the tactical layer are fully meshing yet. One thing that we haven't mentioned that I want to bring up here is that the game does allow for open PvP. When you start playing the game, you can have it turned off but the game does promote a heavy PvP side where you can play in real time with other players against their team and there will be rewards at the end of a season. Now at the time of playing this game, that kind of stuff we could not see. Now you are not forced into PvP as we had that turn off while we were playing it, but that system could become either a big or not so big factor depending upon the audience and the reach the game has. From a progression standpoint, the game I think lacks some of the onboarding or general smoothness of the MMO progression curve. We played this for I think at least an hour and a half, maybe close to two hours on stream, and we did not get close to even leveling up one time. And that is not what you want to see. You want the player to always be feeling like they're making momentum. Now, from a UI standpoint, I did run into some quality of life and playability issues on that front. For instance, when you're in combat, although you couldn't see do the my window in the bottom left, the various UI commands seem to be randomly shuffled in terms of their placement. While the hotkeys remain the same, that is kind of a design no-no. Like, if I want to make sure I'm clicking on Overwatch for each one of my characters, I won't be able to do that instinctively without even having to look at the UI, just by knowing its general position. We also ran into some annoyances when it came to having to refit and repair items on each character. There didn't seem to be an easy way to set this up automatically or say that if character runs out of ammo, make sure to take ammo from the available pool if it's there. And so much of, I think, the mid to late game design of Dreadlands, we weren't able to really see, and hence why this is a first look video. 
And I'll be interested to hear what people think of this game, who made it further in, especially getting to maybe like fame levels 3, 4, and so on. The game definitely still has time in, in its early access, and we haven't yet seen what the third clan is going to be. But how much the importance of multiplayer, I think it's going to be dependent on, again, where the fan base goes from here. Because I've played MMO style games or PvP oriented style games that just collapse due to not having enough people to support that layer. And the game at the moment can be played entirely, I guess quote unquote, single player, with each faction having its own campaign. Now what you do when you're finished with that campaign remains to be seen. But with that said, we're going to wrap up this first look here. I would like to thank developers for giving me a press key to check this one out, and there will be an interview with the creative designer on it going up real soon. Again, as we've said, with this being an early access, what you see may not represent the current version of it. And if you like me to look your game of the future, please don't hesitate to get in touch and check back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where exam they are in science of games. Once again, this has been Dreadlands, and I will see you all next time. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoy things, be sure to do all the liking and subscribing that the kids are doing these days. Check out our Discord channel link down below where we hang out and chat game design, and come back later tonight for our regular streamings. But that's it. And tune in for more great content here and on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games.